Hello and welcome to Cannaman TV. My name is Conor McLeod and this is episode 7 of Cannabis News Scotland where I'll be covering news in Scotland, the UK and internationally. Now then, let's talk cannabis. So, the very first article I'll be covering in Scotland and the UK is Dundee Electrician, uh, an article from the Courier. Dundee Electrician, cannabis, good diet and exercise freed me from MS misery. Freed me from MS misery. Um, so this is Andy Easton from Broughty Ferry, just outside of Dundee, has turned his life around. It says for, uh, and 23 years on from his MS diagnosis, he is free from the diseases, physical and mental agony. It says here, it's like in an interview with The Courier and even Telegraph, the dad of two lifts the lid on how he went from a bright schoolboy to a troubled teen suffering health problems. And essentially it's his message to the UK and Scottish governments about the benefit of cannabis after he has been using cannabis to mediate his symptoms. So the, re- the reason it's five years since he saw a doctor and no longer takes the medic- and no longer takes the medication which costs the NHS £1,800 is because Andy has been consuming cannabis he has been having a very active um, lifestyle and uh, um, a good diet. So, again, it goes to show you one of those things where it's not just cannabis that's good for you. You know, you really cannabis um, encourages homeostasis, but it encourages homeostasis more so when you have a good diet and a regular exercise, which again just encourages natural, healthy physiology. Um, so it says here that Andy was classified 80% disabled, sent home without explanation, treatment or cure. And says it was a case of here's a leaflet. More than two decades on, Andy now has his own business as an electrician and handyman. So yeah, so Andy essentially took it upon himself to consume cannabis. And uh, so it says, after, so after lots of research, I made my plan including vaped volcano weed. Essentially vaped, which is just a volcano vaporizer, traditional and... Um, relatively infamous volcano vaporizer so um started vaping volcano weed cbd 100 percent anti-inflammatory diet and no sitting during the day the vape opened my mind cleared my brain fog i only needed to inhale the bag and i can go and do something active i don't sit down during the day as a result of his um self-medication self-medicating i should say which is kind of uh Counter to the stereotype that cannabis causes laziness, um, this gentleman has been taking cannabis and it's actually been encouraging um, an energetic lifestyle, which is not uncommon. Um, it's tremendous to see. Um, it's tremendous to see. It's tremendous to see cannabis having such a um, positive in- influence on individuals who ordinarily if they hadn't used cannabis, would essentially have an extremely lowered standard of living as a result. But as it says here, that Andy is now extremely active, he's got his own company, and he gets to enjoy life as he once did as a result of um, using cannabis to manage his MS. So moving on to the Edinburgh News evening, Edinburgh Evening News, still in Scotland obviously, Um, this article Titled Cannabis, The Ugly Truth About Child Slavery and Secret Farms in Scotland Cannot Be Ignored by Users. Alex Cole Hamilton, MSP. So hidden Scottish farms which cultivate cannabis on an industrial scale are tended by children who have been trafficked to this country and held against their will and conditions of slavery. I've got to say the reason I chose this article was because of the way it's um, structured, essentially. Um, so it goes on to say, to highlight the very obvious tragedy that's associated with um, cannabis farms and the, the Im- imprisonment and slavery that's associated with the illegal basis behind recreational cannabis consumption in Scotland. So for many recreational cannabis users, the article says, in Scotland, this will come as a shock and an inconvenient truth, but it's happening now and on a wider scale than you might think. Um yeah, so frustratingly, if the, there was much more greater accessibility towards cannabis, then we won't have these criminal gangs um, forcing children and um, individuals into slavery conditions. So, 
in reality is this is one of the if not the most tragic element um, when it comes to maintaining the illegality of cannabis it's like the there are people this is the harm this is the harm here from cannabis the, the harm is caused by the illegality it's caused by criminal gangs and it's caused by legislation which encourages this kind of behavior it says liberal democrats would take this business out of the hands of traffickers clean it tax it and make it safe in the meantime we need to alert private citizens who use cannabis to the dark underbelly of the trade trafficking children for cannabis cultivation is a form of modern slavery pure and simple we need to work together to end it now i fully agree cannabis cultivation trafficking children for the purpose of of cannabis cultivation 100 percent is modern slavery and 100 percent would be prevented if cannabis was legalized um, and regulated and controlled because then no longer will you have and not only that it has to happen quicker um than what politicians are, are hoping because the industry doesn't change overnight so once cannabis becomes decriminalized or once becomes um, legally available to consume or purchase recreational cannabis you still have this intermediate um, intermittent period where there's a transition between the black market and um, authentic purchasing um, through official vendors that doesn't happen overnight as we've seen in Canada so Canada legalized um, a couple of years ago now and uh, they still seen the same situation. They seem, uh, they see, I think it was something like forty eight percent of consumers, um, maybe last year. The number could be slightly wrong, but um, were still buying from black market. So that's still going to encourage a unfortunate illegal interaction when it comes to cannabis. So what's necessary, really, is um, to to really to to decriminalise, to legalise, and to really fast forward, so that the so that children and um, adults are not engaged in forced. Um, labor and slavery conditions as a result of uh, legislation which is quite obviously damaging to individuals who are not only consuming cannabis but also individuals who have nothing to do with cannabis who are getting caught up in this um, myriad of uh, tragic circumstances as a, result, as a result of poor legislation which encourages criminal behavior. So moving on to something a little more positive here, um, this is the Scottish Hemp Association and the latest meeting with Food Standards Scotland. So again, Scottish Hemp Association is doing tremendous work. This meeting was on the, the Friday the 23rd of July, which is uh, slightly less than a week ago. Um, and it's just following up on the, the meeting with Food Standards Scotland, which um, it goes to show that it really does help um, to join these uh, organisations. So it says here that in recent times, CBD businesses have become increasingly frustrated at the delays and lack of updates from the novel food process. The public list from the FSA, which is the Food Standards Agency, has been delayed a few times now and many feel their businesses on hold while awaiting updates and clarity. So a lot of businesses will not be trading as a result of the potential that they will be trading with an illegal substance. So their business, as it says here, is on hold. There and, and as a result, most everything else will fall like a domino effect for the individuals engaged with the business. Um, so while we understand there is a lot of paperwork, bureaucracy and red tape to deal with, at the same time, like CBD businesses have been told in the run-up to the 31st of March 2021, you had plenty of time to prepare for this. Burn! Ultimate burn towards government for that, and rightly so, because CBD companies, businesses are being... Um, scrutinized because they've not went through the same process but at the same time government are not actually putting in place the, their action their their role and um, by producing the the appropriate lists which will show people that they can actually trade so considering the success of the cbd industry both from an economic and social perspective contrasted with the lack of will to have any cross-department talks to find a solution for the cbd industry it's disappointing but not surprising to see progress hampered in this way um Fortunately, though, it does say here that um, the Scottish Hemp Association has received messages of support from businesses in the United States and the EU who have decided to give the UK a swear for now because it's too much hassle. Um, but yeah, the, the fortunate element, it says here, for, for CBD companies in Scotland, it says here, as the Food Standards Scotland emphasised at the meeting, the FSA public list, which is um, for England and I think Wales, Public list is of no concern to us and does not apply in Scotland. So the, the FSA list does not apply in Scotland. It doesn't mean that the novel foods is not going to be um, extremely impactful in Scotland. It already has been impactful, but um, I think it just implies that it's going to be pushed down the road until a much more stable alternative is presented. Um, I think the, the most 
clear example, the, the most clear message that's, that's taken from this, from the latest meeting with the, the Food Standards Scotland and the Scottish Hemp Association is it really does pay off to be um, a part of the Scottish Hemp Association and other authoritative bodies that interact on a face-to-face -face value with the correct authoritative um, bodies such as Food Standards Scotland. Um, what the Scottish Hemp Association have done have really pushed the information that's going on about novel foods they've really taken it to the food standards scotland and as a result of enlightening the the individuals in the food standards scotland has put a hindrance in the novel foods process so it's really put a halt and in the as a result of that it really has as a direct result of um, the scottish hemp association's actions it has most likely kept the door open for hundreds of cbd businesses in scotland to continue trading and that will have a huge impact on their families on their on their close networks that um are also reliant on the on the business and that's all a direct result of the scottish hemp association's um insistence that novel foods rightly so should not really be applicable um to the vast majority of the market the only way just to repeat as i've done in numerous other videos is the only way that novel foods should really be applicable is to um cbd isolates and synthetic um cannabinoids they should be applicable to the novel foods and rightly so whereas full spectrum um cbd products should not be um, and this is essentially what we're really trying to push towards so um again a tremendous uh, huge high five to kyle Esplan and uh, the Scottish Hemp Association because they are working really hard to maintain um, transparency for the CBD industry and if you have not already um, participated and uh, joined the Scottish Hemp Association I would recommend you do so because as you can see from here it does make an impact because these people are looking for the, the most ethical and um, sustainable approach to the CBD industry and this will transfer over I mean the Scottish Hemp, uh, Scottish Hemp Association will not be stopping obviously at the CBD um, sector this this uh, ethical approach will be transferred over to to um, hemp uh, and uh, every other attachment to the to the associations. The as the in the UK as a whole, we have the Cannabis Industry Council. Now this article is from Business Can. We have the Cannabis Industry Council, the reasonable, constructive, and proactive face of the UK cannabis. Now I interviewed Mike Barnes, who's the intern chair of the Cannabis Industry Council. I interviewed him last year, uh, last week. Um, you find a the link on the channel and uh, essentially it was a really exciting really interesting interview because essentially what we're dealing with now with cannabis Industry council is the best example of unity within the the cannabis industry in the uk and there are conflicts 100 percent in the mainstream um cannabis industry in the uk not referring to activists or any of that kind of thing mainstream um cannabis companies are at loggerheads as a result of the um the difficulty so so we have this fragmented cannabis industry in the uk where we're dealing with the cbd sector we have the same the, the hemp industry the medicinal cannabis and the elephant in the room being recreational cannabis which for this moment has not really been spoken about because um as professor barnes had indicated in the interview he really wants to stabilise medical cannabis industry in the UK first. There's no point in beginning uh, or talks or um, structuring recreational or adult use cannabis without there being a stable foundation for medical use. So that's the that's the starting point. <coughs> and in, a, in an attempt, in a you know, and in order to unify the entire industry, the Cannabis Industry Council has been created. Now, what it's going to incorporate is it's going to incorporate, I think, it's five or six different. Um, compartments of uh, of the cannabis and of the cannabis industry being uh, medical cannabis the cbd sector and um, the hemp industry and uh, i think there's lobbying and uh, research and social influence i think it's something along the lines of that and each single one of these compartments are going to be designed um, oh wait we have it right here so we're we currently have six subgroups, research, environmental and social responsibility, hemp, quality standards, parliamentary lobbying and media and um, soon they will be joined by a medical cannabis subgroup and I really think this is an extremely exciting move forward because the, the cannabis industry is so fragmented that it's really put a hindrance in the development of, of how it can move forward um, quicker. So this is a tremendous boost um, for the UK and, and, and the reality is we need to really support this situation. So in, in order to maintain um, transparent direction over the cannabis industry, we really need to support um, authoritative bodies which hope to maintain the efficiency of the industry and not hope to privately 
um, benefit as a result of manipulation of legislation and so forth. So, um, so yeah, you can find the interview with Professor Mike Barnes on the channel. I'll put a link in the description box below and you'll get all the information you need about the Cannabis Industry Council from that interview because it's, it's um, very informative. <laughs> CBD industry now. So CBD products being recalled in Ireland because they contain too much THC. This is the journal um, Ireland.ie. Um, several CBD products in Ireland are being recalled because they contain too much THC, the active ingredient in cannabis which makes users experience highs. Food Standard, Food Safety Authority of Ireland said the affected products range from food supplements to bottles of CBD oil, which customers take by placing drops under the tongue. Now, this is kind of flashbacks from last year, or, um, yeah, last year, potentially the beginning of this year, when a similar situation, I think maybe even two years ago, when a similar situation happened when I think that it might have been the Association of the Cannabis Industry had produced a, um analysis of... CBD products, which are which seem to be prevalent in the in the industry, and what they found was there was a real c inconsistency between the contents uh, and um, and the reality, the the contents on the side of the bottle and the reality of actually what was contained in the product. And what they found was the THC threshold was very often um, exceeding their legal limit, and this is this was obviously a problem. So it seems to be the same issue happens over here in Ireland as as happening over in Ireland. Um. Inevitably, these products are going to be um, taken off the shelves. So, yeah, so, I mean, this is uh, beginning stages of a uh, similar situation that happened in the UK, and hopefully this will um, iron itself out quicker than it did over here. So this is part of, uh, this is from the BBC, Cannabis part of the future, says Tobacco Giant. So the BBC produced an article here that says the UK's largest tobacco firm says it sees cannabis as part of its future as it tries to move away from selling traditional cigarettes. It's British American Tobacco said it wanted to accelerate its transformation by reducing health impacts of its products. It's almost a fucking joke that that's what they're trying to say here. But nevertheless, because um, tobacco obviously is uh, really good for you and healthy and everybody should include it in their diet. So... Um, it says it signed a deal to research a new range of adult cannabis products initially focused on CBD and it thinks the Mr. Wheaton, which is the chief marketing officer for British American Tobacco, said its cannabis related products um, are part of its future growth. And it says he thinks CBD vaping is part of the future, but the present challenge is reduced harm in tobacco and nicotine alternatives, encouraging people to switch. Yeah, that's a, it's a really weird thing when you have somebody selling cigarettes and yeah, these are really, these are really bad for you and um, you shouldn't smoke them. But hey... We've got a great deal on this variety. So, I don't know. That is positive and hopefully there'll be... Hopefully in the near future, tobacco... I mean, it's already doing that. Tobacco's plummeting when it comes to the, the use of cannabis. When cannabis consumption goes up, tobacco consumption often goes down. I only think the reason the reason that that doesn't happen is potentially in Europe. Europe, um, over here in the UK, it's the same where a lot of people consume recreational cannabis with tobacco and that's the harm. You know, you have hundreds of chemicals in, in tobacco. You know, 60, 70, 80 of them are known to cause cancer uh, of some variety and yet they, they're still consumed. So it's not really the harm that's caused by cannabis is um, minimal compared to that that's caused by um, tobacco. And yet, we still have tobacco legally available. But that's a whole different conversation. So yeah, cannabis part of the future, it says tobacco giants, and we can only hope that as a result of them engaging with that, there will be a reduction in people that actually consume tobacco. So continuing on, continuing on with CBD, we have uh, the Evening Standard, which shows Love Hemp sees revenues soar amid growing interest in the CBD sector. So Anthony Joshua, backed CBD brand, said it expects to grow further next year via Amazon partnership. So Love Hemp recently um, essentially employed Anthony Joshua as an um, ambassador for CBD, for the Love Hemp brand, and as a result, their profits have continued to increase. Um, and they're really hoping that it's going to be the exact same situation um, as a result of joining with Amazon, who everybody, most people will be aware that Amazon actually promoted 
themselves as pro cannabis and that they will eventually be engaging with um cannabis trade essentially so um exciting times ahead for everybody speaking of the uh, american cbd industry the opinion seems to be cbd industry needs regulation to bring legitimacy this is essentially coming off the back of essentially what the uk is doing so the uk are a global leader in cbd and I think it has been helped by the regulation, even though there is, there is very much conflict when it comes to novel foods. And I, again, as Professor Mike Barnes mentioned, novel foods was kind of like opening a walnut with a sledgehammer. I think that's something you said. Um, whereas we could have had a much more um, accessible approach without there being so, such a heavy-handed response by the, the authoritative bodies. But that doesn't... But that's obviously ongoing at the moment, and essentially it looks to be that the the American CBD market is essentially trying to stabilise itself in order to profit directly. So, again, exciting times ahead for uh, CBD. And the final article on the CBD um, side is uh, from Yahoo Finance, and it actually says here, Pressure Biosciences Nano Emulsion Platform will bring more effective, more shelf-stable CBD infused beverages to the market by end of 2021. Now I'm fucking out of breath reading that article title. Um, CBD infused beverages will soon be available to consumers worldwide thanks to Nano Emulsion producing ultra sheer technology platform developed by Pressure Biosciences Incorporated. Fuck's sake! <laughs> what a fucking mouthful. So projected growth. So essentially, what they're doing this company, um, Pressure Biosciences Nano Emulsion platform is that they're essentially trying to stabilise, as it says here, um, CBD-infused beverages, because CBD is oil-soluble, um, so they're really trying to make it water-soluble to make it more stable and to make it that the dosage requirement is what people, much easier for people to, 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 to get at. So it says here that the World Health Organization estimates that as little as 6% of CBD oil is actually absorbed when ingested or applied topically. The rest passes through the body unused and wasted. So that's a huge issue. Obviously, 6% of CBD oil is um, not even close enough. 96% I think people will be satisfied with, but 6%? That's a joke. medicinal cannabis so medicinal cannabis improves quality of life for patients with high grade gliomas now this is cancer therapy advisor this is really exciting because i interviewed um justin kander recently and uh, he ha he is the lead research coordinator for ant zelda's which is essentially a cannabis extraction um company unless i'm unless i'm getting it wrong and he made a very clear statement on it that he finds it absurd that um that cannabis is not being trialed on individuals with cancer or uh, terminal cancer or terminal conditions because they have nothing to lose so this is really exciting here that um medicinal cannabis improves quality of life for patients with high-grade gliomas and now glioma i think is uh, a form of tumor which is found i think in the brain stem and the spine unless i'm mistaken um, and what it says here was that um Essentially, the, the study suggested that cannabis, especially a one-to-one -one CBD THC mixture, can be helpful for many of the symptoms impacting uh, gliomas in this patient population, especially sleep disturbance. So that's really interesting. That it's a CBD uh, to THC mixture of one-to-one -one ratio, which is the most efficient. And um, because what it also says is that uh, ratios of four-to-one THC to CBD or CBD to THC four-to-one um, and other ratios weren't as successful in encouraging a therapeutic response. So it really does show you that there needs to be a, a balance between the CBD THC mixture um, for this situation at the very least. But it does seem to be if we're to take the, the knowledge of epileptic children, it seems to be again a, a one to one ratio seems to be the most efficient um, method. So that's again really exciting and I hope that there is much more research into cannabis and cancer than there has been in the past. So, from Leafy, cannabis used as a substitute for prescription medicines survey shows. Now, this is not new knowledge, but it's certainly stuff that we need to be more and more aware of, that um, cannabis reduces the amount of prescription medicines consumed. And as we've seen, so in a lot of the states in America, 
what's been what's been seen really is that when cannabis consumption or has been decriminalized or legalized the the consumption of pharmaceuticals goes down and um the consumption of cannabis increases and what what particularly there seems to be the consumption of benzodiazepines which are deadly um they really are they're over um prescribed and over consumed and they are deadly so to see a reduction in benzodiazepines um, particularly as a result of cannabis becoming more accessible is tremendous and, and it really should be encouraged. So that's what this um, this article points towards. So it's cannabis consumers frequently use it to replace prescription medicines. And the Centre for Alcohol and Drug Research in, in Denmark questioned over almost 3,000 uh, cannabis consumers to understand the motivation and impact of substituting prescription drugs such as opioids with uh, cannabis opioids and antidepressants with cannabis. It says 46% of respondents said that they um, seen substantially decrease, they substantially decreased their prescription medications. 38% reported um, at least one prescription medicine being removed from their from their diet, essentially. 66% of respondents perceived cannabis to be much more effective than prescribed drugs, and 86% said that cannabis had less side effects than the prescription drugs they'd been taking. So yes, I mean, it's just, again, positive um, data collection as a result of uh, individuals who are being studied to use cannabis over medical um, alternatives. Uh, Yeah, medical alternatives. One of the things that's really that should be pointed out here as well when it comes to medical cannabis is the level of real world data. That's what we're looking for here. Real world data. Very often, they continuously, the, the, the rhetoric in the UK and internationally, but if, speaking just from the UK's point of view, that the rhetoric seems to be we do not have enough clinical data. and We need enough clinical data, we need clinical data. But the reality is, it'll take a long time for that to be accumulated. And in the meantime, most likely, it seems to be that people will be able to access recreational cannabis before they're able to access um, medical cannabis as a result of waiting for these clinical trials. So it could take two, three, four years for clinical trials to um, conclude and produce the data necessary and then it could be additional time on top of that to actually manufacture the correct um, substances, the correct drugs and then to give them to the to the patients. In that time period, most likely the recreational cannabis, adult use cannabis will be accessible and as a result, you'll have medical patients requiring medicine going through the adult use sector in order to acquire their medicine because the medical establishment hasn't caught up with the real world data that's necessary because there's a priority of um, randomized con- controlled trials. So randomized controlled trials are um, are good and they've taken us to where we are really when it comes to medicine. Um, but at the same time, randomized controlled trials are 100% non-applicable to cannabis as a medicine because of the diverse molecular complexity that's present um, in the in the chemical profile of cannabis and it just completely cannabis as a plant really undermines the the scientific method you know it really does and i to be honest quite frankly say that with pride i don't know why <laughs> um so yeah so yeah, so that's uh, exciting stuff. We're getting informed here that cannabis obviously is reducing the amount of pharmaceuticals that are needing to be consumed, which essentially when you look at all the, the, the pages on Facebook and all the cannabis-related groups, that's all you see. You see people describing that they were consuming X amount of pharmaceuticals and then so many years later they've only been consuming cannabis and they've got this before and after picture which is bl- almost day and night. So you've got the person consuming prescription drugs and their face may be swollen or they'll have other um, very noticeable physical consequences of them using pharmaceutical substances, pharmaceutical drugs. And then you fast forward to their continuous cannabis use and then they have this much healthier, happier, like much well, like the, the, their increased well-being is in the picture of the individual. So um, so yeah, it's, just, it's good to see more uh, data which is, which is conforming to the real world data which... Uh, which shows that cannabis is really good for everybody. So this article from The Guardian is, uh, is medical cannabis really a magic bullet? Now, the reason I chose this one, this article, is because I think the title itself, Is Medical Cannabis Really a Magic Bullet? First off, you really shouldn't associate bullet with something that's supposed to be positive. Like, nobody's like, oh, yeah, oh, fucking bullet, and it was good. Nobody does that, no. It's just not the case. So, um, 
and to say that it's a magic bullet implies this like non-empirical element almost um i just i don't really like the title at all and um and even the article itself it seems very vanilla in comparison to what the reality is so research increasingly suggests that extracts from the plant are effective in treating pain anxiety epilepsy and more but experts still preach caution around recreational use experts people who have never used cannabis in their life experts people who have been um ideolog ideologically tied to the scientific method are the experts um and again i'm not slating the scientific method whatsoever you know we have we have technological revolution as a result of the scientific method but i think again it's cannabis does not conform whatsoever and when you have experts that are talking about cannabis who have no knowledge of it i really think it, um, it undermines the, the efficiency of what cannabis is it says there are several concerns that scientists and medical professionals have with medical cannabis while cannabis is purported to have many benefits very few indications have rigorous evidence around both the risks and benefits for medical use um the main safety concerns involve the use of a smoked product, which can lead to a chronic cough and bronchitis um, and risks for certain populations such as those with family history of schizophrenia. So schizophrenia and psychosis, obviously people do respond um, negatively to cannabis, but this should not be applicable to the general response of cannabis. So individuals that get a schizophrenic or psychotic response as a result of consuming cannabis already had an underlying medical psychotic schizophrenic con condition that was exacerbated by using cannabis. So straight away... It does become very difficult. It's, it's, it's as if to say that we should really study the impact of epileptic. Um, we should really study the impact of flashing lights and movies because we have a small portion of the population that's epileptic. No, you just put in warnings and you put in, in, in cautionary measures in order to prevent this small, sensitive group of the population from being harmed. Um, and cannabis, as we've all seen, is not given the same liberty. Um, and when it says the the obviously smoked product concerns uh, it could cause a chronic cough and bronchitis yeah for people that have got really sensitive lung capacity because what it seems to have shown in the past is that cannabis consumption actually encourages um i think it's cpr not cpr crp um i don't remember what it's called there's a there's a breathing test that's done to to analyze the capacity the lung capacity of the individual and uh, cannabis has no impact on that if anything it has a positive impact i think um i think i've heard that cannabis actually encourages um an increased lung capacity but I, again i could be wrong but it's somewhere in the back of my mind that that's the case but one of the things that did pop to mind is that there was a study done over the course of 30 or 40 years with um rastafarians who obviously consume cannabis rigorously um and on a religious basis pun intended and um what they found was over the course of 40, 50 years, individuals who were reaching 60 and 70 years old who'd used, consumed cannabis on a daily basis, sometimes seven grams on a joint, they found absolutely no negative impact to the, to the conditions of these individuals' lungs in comparison to individuals who are of a similar age and never consumed cannabis their entire life. So that really undermines the basis that cannabis has a negative impact on your lung capacity. Um, I think, if anything, you know, it does, obviously cannabis does, smoking it does has negative impacts, but it doesn't even nearly point in the same way as um, as things like tobacco or others. And I think vaping, as, uh, which is interesting that they're not really, they're, they're analysing the negative benefits, but individuals that, that consume cannabis medically are never told to smoke it. They're always told to vape or consume through ingesting edibles. So it's a strange criticism to have um but yeah maybe they should just have a joint and chill the fuck out so um medical medicinal cannabis growth to be permitted in guernsey again it's another bbc article and it's really good because guernsey are uh, of the of the of the crown dependencies guernsey are the last i think to of the of isle of man jersey and guernsey they're the last ones to accept it because isle of man and uh, jersey um unless i'm mistaken have northern leaf and northern leaf are a uh, um medicinal cannabis producer so the channel islands cannabis industry association said it was a significant milestone and put guernsey on a level footing with other crown dependencies such as jersey and the isle of man um so yeah so cultivation of cannabis will only be permitted under license with applications handled by the new ballywick of guernsey cannabis agency that's exciting 
So again, these are there are there are agencies, there are um, organisations and authoritative bodies which have been put in place um, in order to handle the cannabis situation as efficient as efficiently as possible, which all the more highlights that cannabis is here to stay. The industry is present and uh, it will continue it will continue to grow, which is just extremely exciting. Moving on to cannabis finance for to go to politics.co.uk how the cannabis sector can kickstart post-COVID recovery. Now, this has been on the on the tip of everybody's tongue for the past year, that cannabis is perfect. Cannabis is perfect for um, boosting the UK economy. In all honesty, cannabis is perfect for boosting the global economy. You have this circumstance that the economy, the, if we're just speaking for the UK, has been decimated as a result of COVID. Industry has ground to a halt, and it's attempting to, to collect its bearings to move forward in some manner and uh, what they could really be doing with is like a, a unicorn that comes in and provides um, finance from almost nowhere and essentially that's what cannabis is. So you have this black market element for the recreational adult use but you also have the CBD sector, we have the hemp industry and we have the medicinal cannabis sector which each single one of these um, sectors has um, lucrative finance attached to it. and. Uh, in order to really kickstart the post-COVID recovery, we really have to move this forward. And I, I mean, as we could see through all these things, the industry's moving. The industry's moving forward. It's, it is. Next article, this is Lexology. The UK revealed as Europe's fastest growing hub for cannabis investment. This is a surprise to essentially no one. The UK has continuously been involved in cannabis over the years with, I think, the United Nations 2018-2019 um, Narcotics Global Report stating that the UK was the number one provider, 90,000 metric tonnes a year. This was in 2018, I think, 2019. Most likely, it will now be Canada will be the number one medicinal exporter, but as the UK struggles to give medicinal cannabis to its its um, patients and to, to the individuals that require it, it is one of the world's fastest um, growing hubs for cannabis. So there is this unfortunate irony, this hypocrisy almost behind the way the UK's behaving um, but like I say things like Cannabis Industry Council and um, individuals uh, that are pushing forward towards uh, authenticity are helping this situation. So the UK is becoming the destination for cannabis capital as multinational companies enter the sector. Retail investment, retail investors flock to crowdfunding sites and the Lo London Stock Exchange opens up for cannabis startups. Now and the, 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 again this is all 50% again this is extremely exciting stuff and it, it's just showing you that um, that the cannabis industry is really accelerating um, tremendously. One of the things that I think will help in a great way um, in the UK is one of the suggestions from the, the report that was produced by Macro Solicitors. Again, I've also I've done a video on that. Um, and what they suggested was to remove or to re-evaluate the proceeds of Crime Act because the proceeds of Crime Act um, inhibits companies from investing in the UK cannabis industry as a result of the legislation stipulating if there's any company that also engages with recreational substance use or recreational um, like con products th uh, that give to rec for a recreational purpose, that's an illegal entity in the UK. So they, they, uh, uh, the finance that they would accumulate as a result of their engagement in the UK market, even if it's medicinally or through CBD, would be classed as uh, proceeds of crime because that same company also interacts on another part of the globe for recreational markets. So again, this is one thing that needs to be altered in order to really um, accelerate the UK market. So once that gets resolved, that'll be much more um, beneficial for the UK economy because you'll have a, lot, a, a much larger dynamic of investors that'll be really pushing that through. Um, but it's not to say that the, that the UK is already is, is slow in any way, shape or form. It's not to say that at all. Because as it says here, um, proactiveinvestors.co.uk, um, Grow Group launches UK's largest ever cannabis crowdfunding campaign. Um, we want Grow to be a pillar of the UK's burgeoning cannabis and medical sector and to be a future leader in the global cannabis medicine market, says CEO Ben Langley. Um, so Grow Group are looking for, um, it hopes to raise 
3.2 million to help scale up operations and uh, it said it's generated 2.3 in revenue in the year to in the year to 20th of July so this year so far they've accumulated 2.3 million in their target so they're about a million off their target um, it says we want to grow to be a pillar of the UK's cannabis sector and that's why we've announced this community crowdfunder today and as it's, as you could see that many individuals see the benefit um, of investing in cannabis companies and um, because they can see that the future is the future is green and to conform with uh, the efficiency behind the the UK financial cannabis sector Cannabo to be UK to be Cannabo to be Europe's biggest public cannabis business after takeover so this is a London listed marijuana business Cannabo has struck a deal and it says that it will become Europe's biggest publicly traded cannabis company now what they've done is they, they have uh, I think they've sampled uh, it says here uh, it's agreed terms to buy the european operations of canada's materia a cannabis pr processor and supplier the only part that we're not involved in now in the supply chain is cultivation so that's a really good move because that will boost the london stock exchange relation that that will boost the the cannabis entities in the in the london stock exchange so materia owns a cannabis processing plant in malta and a wholesaling business in germany which is the largest market for legal marijuana in europe it's very unique because it allows you to make Malta the doorway to Germany and Europe. So that's really exciting, Cannabo, to be Europe's biggest public cannabis business. And just to wrap up this week's uh, Cannabis News Scotland, adult use cannabis legalisation is picking up pace in the Americas. Uh, the 14th of July, the Senate passed a draft bill which would federally legalise cannabis in the United States. This is a big deal. As soon as the United States fully um, legalises on a federal level, that it will be impossible for the UK or other countries to really, um, other western countries to really um, negate the cannabis green rush essentially if that's what we're dealing with. So the moment that, um, as you can see here, projected sales of adult use cannabis in Europe is, uh, is just going to absolutely skyrocket until 2025. So we've got another four years of continuous growth before most likely there will be a stability in the market. It says legalisation of cannabis across Europe will not only create a new market, but will also have a significant impact on the medical side of the industry. The relationship between these two segments has indeed always been a controversial one. Exactly. The reason why it's been a controversial one between medical and recreational cannabis use is because it's very difficult to distinguish individuals using recreationally because as a consequence of using cannabis generally, you get a therapeutic response. So you might get relaxation, you might have a uh, peace of mind, increased well-being, um, better sleep, um, chronic pain issues, which you didn't actually, you weren't aware that were chronic. You just, you know, it's just an, an issue ongoing and that would be relieved as a result of using cannabis recreationally. So this is, that's the controversial element um, for anybody unaware. Um, so again, with legalization of medical cannabis will come an increased awareness of, uh, of adult use cannabis um, and not in the negative perspective, which many take. So this article is very exciting. So yeah, so adult use cannabis legalization in Europe, it's coming faster than you think. That's what she said. No. So uh, so yeah, so thanks for joining me for this week's Cannabis News Scotland. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure and like and subscribe and join me on Patreon where for £3 a month you can help to build a stronger cannabis media platform. I'll see you next time.